Hey everyone, check this out. Kim Kardashian recently got hit with a massive fine. We're talking more than a million dollars. Why? She didn't tell her followers that she was getting paid to hype a cryptocurrency on her social media account. Now, even if you're not a fan of Kim Kardashian, what happened to her is a real wake-up call for all of us. Whether you're selling stuff on eBay, shopping on Amazon, dreaming of running a company like Google, or just posting on Instagram, it's important to know the rules of the game when it comes to e-commerce laws. Hi, I'm Professor Mark Robowski, and I'm here to guide you through the maze of e-contracts, taxes, advertising rules, and all the essential legal stuff you need to know in the U.S. digital market. So let's dive in. Let's start with e-contracts, something you're dealing with every day without even knowing it. You know when you're just checking your Gmail or scrolling through Instagram, you're actually agreeing to a bunch of legal stuff in the background. These are called electronic contracts, or e-contracts for short. They're like the digital handshake deals we make all the time. Think about it. When you buy something online, you and the seller are in an e-contract where they promise to send you that item you bought, and you agree to pay up. The incredible part is, often there's no need for a signature, or even real money exchanging hands right away. And it's not just about buying stuff. Ever use Facebook, Snapchat, or Instagram? They're free, right? But there's a catch. When you hit that I agree button on their terms of service, you know that long text everyone skips reading, you're actually entering an e-contract. These cover everything from what they can do with your data to what happens if you guys have a disagreement. There are two main types of these e-contracts, click wrap and browser wrap. Click wrap is when you actually have to click something to say you agree, like when you're signing up for a new app. Browser wrap is sneakier. The terms are there, usually in a link at the bottom of the page, but you don't have to click agree to use that site. Now, whether these contracts hold up in court can get tricky. It often depends on whether you really had a chance to know what you were agreeing to. Courts usually recognize click wrap agreements since you have to actively agree, but they're less likely to recognize browser wrap agreements as being legally binding since many people don't even know they're agreeing to anything. So the next time you're breezing through those terms and conditions, remember, you're actually making a deal. Speaking of court decisions, in 2017, a big decision came down from a federal court that's all about making the web more accessible for everyone. Basically, if you're running a website or an app, whether it's for your side hustle or a full-blown business, uh, you've got to ensure it's accessible to people with disabilities like blindness or deafness. In order to be in compliance with the federal law known as the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA for short, Courts have ruled that websites and apps need to work well with tools like screen readers, which read out loud what's on the screen, and braille displays, which turn text into braille for blind users. For people making websites, this means they've got to do things like make sure images have descriptions that can be read by screen readers, and that videos come with captions for those who can't hear. A lot of times websites miss the mark on this because the people building them didn't think about these accessibility features from the start. This can lead to big problems, like getting sued. For instance, there was this case where Beyonce's website got called out by a blind woman because it was all visuals, and there was no way for someone who can't see to use it. Though that lawsuit got dropped, it's a heads up for anyone with a website or app. If you're not making your digital spaces friendly for everyone, you could end up in hot water, not to mention leave out a whole group of people from using your site. Now let's shift gears to advertising laws. Online advertisements can be edgy and controversial. That's perfectly legal. But they can't be false or misleading. And promoting discrimination or illegal stuff is definitely illegal. So, for example, you can't run an advertisement for someone looking to hire a hitman. Back in 2013, there was a website known as Silk Road that was like an online black market for illegal drugs. The FBI swooped in, shut it down, and sent the anonymous website owner to prison for the rest of his life. It turns out that Ross Ulbricht wasn't anonymous enough to evade the FBI. Nowadays, a popular type of advertising involves influencers and celebrities endorsing products on social media. Ever noticed how they sometimes add a sponsored hashtag to their social media posts? 
That's because the law, specifically the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, says that they have to be upfront about getting paid or receiving perks for those endorsements. If they don't, it can cost them big time. In addition, the United States Securities Act requires that those who are paid to endorse financial products, like cryptocurrencies, must go a step further and disclose who is paying them and exactly how much they're getting paid. Take Kim Kardashian, for instance. She got fined $1.3 million for not disclosing a paid crypto promotion. Talk about an expensive lesson, especially since she only got $250,000 for the promo. So whether you're a fan or an aspiring influencer, keep this in mind. Another common form of online advertising involves texts and emails. Many businesses consider direct mails and texts to potential customers to be vital for advertising their products and services. But the average person may find these messages to be annoying spam. Fortunately, there are laws about this. Businesses have to give you an option to say no thanks to these ads so that you can opt out of receiving future messages. If they keep bombarding you without this option, they're actually risking some serious fines for spamming. It falls under a federal law known as the Can Spam Act. All right, let's talk about something that hits close to home for all of us who shop online. Taxes. There's been a big change in e-commerce law that's all about sales tax. So here's the deal. Depending on where you're buying stuff from online, you might now see a sales tax added to your purchase. This change came about because of a Supreme Court case in 2018. Before this ruling, online stores didn't have to charge sales tax if they didn't have a physical presence, like an actual shop or warehouse, in your state. That's why a lot of online businesses set up shop in states without sales taxes, like Delaware. But then states that were losing out on tax money got fed up and took the issue to court. The Supreme Court decided that even if an online store doesn't have a physical location in a state, if they're shipping stuff to it, they've technically got a presence there. That means they've got to collect sales tax. Now, most states have laws that make big online marketplaces like Etsy and eBay handle this tax stuff for the sellers. So the next time you're shopping online and see that extra tax on your bill, it's because of this court ruling. Just a heads up for when you're budgeting for those late night online shopping sprees. Now let's talk about all that personal info you put out there when you're online shopping or signing up for stuff. Ever wondered where it all goes? Here's the deal. Businesses are scooping up data like your name, where you live, and what you buy. The catch is, while there's no big overarching law that covers all data collection, there are some pretty important exceptions. For example, if you're under 13, websites aren't allowed to collect your personal information. That's according to a federal law known as the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. And if a site you use gets hacked or your data is stolen, they're legally required to let you know. It's like a digital watch your back rule. Moving on to online reviews, we all read them, and maybe you've written a few. If you've had a lousy experience with a product or service, you're totally free to go online and tell the world about it. Thanks to the First Amendment and your freedom of speech, voicing your honest experience is totally within your rights. Plus, there's a law specifically protecting this freedom known as the Consumer Review Fairness Act. This law stops businesses from slipping gag clauses into contracts that try to muzzle customers from speaking out or hit them with penalties for airing their genuine critiques. But remember, with great power comes great responsibility. If you post something that's not true and it really harms the business, you could end up in legal hot water. It's like walking a tightrope between sharing your opinion and accidentally spreading false information. So you can say that a restaurant's food and service were lousy. You're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to make up false facts. So if you make up an outright lie that the business can prove is false, like saying that the restaurant is selling rat meat and calling it chicken, you could be sued for business defamation. And here's a twist in the plot fake reviews. Some businesses actually pay people to write glowing reviews. This sneaky tactic is called astroturfing. Not only is it misleading, but it's also straddling a legal gray area. Amazon has sued thousands of people for this. So next time you see a product with all five-star reviews, remember, 
it's not always what it seems. Moving on to our next issue, intellectual property is another key area for e-commerce, and it's a double-edged sword. On one hand, you want to guard your creative ideas and content from being copied. On the other, it's crucial to make sure you're not accidentally using someone else's work without permission. Here's a real kicker of a story. Zillow, the popular real estate website, was hit with nearly a $2 million court judgment against it. Why? They used a photographer's photos on their site without getting the green light first. That's a costly mistake. The takeaway is pretty clear. If you didn't create the content, always get permission before using it, especially if it's part of your money-making plan. Another common IP issue is counterfeit goods. Say you're the owner of a cool clothing brand, but you notice there are merchants online selling cheap knockoffs of it. That might undercut your prices, which can hurt your sales and tarnish your brand's image. Here's where the law steps in. Unauthorized resellers can't legally sell anything that deviates from your original product. That's a big no-no in the world of IP law. If you're caught in this tangle, it might be time to bring a lawyer into the mix and help straighten things out. So for all you budding entrepreneurs, content creators, and online merchants out there, remember to keep an eye on IP laws. It's about safeguarding your creations while also respecting the work of others. I'll delve into IP law much deeper in another video. Now let's shift gears to the issue of antitrust laws. In the digital world, believe it or not, there's a such thing as being too successful. It sounds strange, but stick with me. In places like the United States, which loves its free market, the government usually lets businesses do their thing. However, when a company gets so big that it basically owns the market, that's where the government might step in. Think of it as a referee stepping in a game where one player is way too dominant. These antitrust laws are becoming increasingly relevant in the digital age. Companies dominating the market may face government action to prevent monopolies that harm consumer interests. As we all rely more on the internet, and tech giants like Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple keep growing, the debate in Congress about regulating them is getting hotter. It's a fascinating and important issue, especially for us who live so much of our lives online. I'll cover that more in depth in a separate video. Finally, remember, we've covered only US laws in this video but international e-commerce laws can vary significantly. The European Union, for example, generally has much stricter laws for businesses and better protections for consumers when it comes to issues such as data protection and antitrust. So always do your research before engaging in overseas business. Well, thank you for joining me. This has been Professor Mark Rodowski.